Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Diana Dark. You are very welcome, Diana. Thank you. Diana is an Arabist and cultural expert who has lived and worked in the Middle East for over 30 years. She is the author of The Merchant of Syria, A History of Survival, and My House in Damascus, An Inside View of the Syrian Crisis. She also tweets, uh, she's very active on Twitter, um, at uh, Diane Dark, that's D-I-A-N-A-D-A-R-K-E. Now, she's also the author of Stealing from the Saracens, How Islamic Architecture Shaped Europe. Here's my copy, and it's a beautifully illustrated book, um, which has received actually much critical praise, including being acclaimed uh, the BBC History Magazine Best Book of 2020. And there's actually a long list of um, uh, awards and uh, and praise, which I could go through, but I'll I'll spare Diane's embarrassment on that. So um, now Diane has uh, very kindly agreed today to give a presentation based on her book, Stealing from the Saracens. That's a very interesting title, which I'm sure she'll explain uh, the meaning of that title. So over to you, Diana. Thank you very much, Paul. I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll get ready to share my images because uh, there are a lot of um, images in this uh, in this talk. Obviously, it's all oh, here we go. Very, very visual. And um, here we go. Yes, yeah, that's the cover. Yeah, right. Yes. So let me let me begin. You mentioned the title, and as you rightly said, it's it's uh, it's quite a provocative title, and that is deliberate, but not in the way that a lot of people have have taken it, a lot of people have taken it literally, basically, and have assumed uh, that this is some kind of pejorative, you know, anti-European thing. But of course, it's not at all. As, as I explain in the book, it's been very carefully chosen as a kind of double irony, because uh, I'll explain the cover first, because this is relevant. So the cover uh, is the dome, the inside vaulting of the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, which you can see there on, on the right. The, the just, I, just, I just point out to people that is in London. So uh, that, that's the, the, the yes. big uh, Church of England Cathedral in London. Yes, absolutely. The very first Anglican cathedral to be built, um, you know, in, in, in this country, in England. Mm -hmm. So an absolute landmark of um, of, of London. And when Christopher Wren built it, he said, the architecture is for eternity. And indeed, it is, you get the feeling it will always be there. Mm. And uh, so the reason that um, we went for this title is Christopher Wren, as I mentioned here, here, here he is, the man himself. Um, mm. He, in his day, he the, the term for Arab Muslims was Saracens or sometimes Mohammedans. You know, the, it was, Islam was very poorly understood as a religion um, back in the 17th century. And so Saracens was the word that was often used for, for um, Arab Muslims. And he, uh, the derivation of the word Saracens is from the Arabic sadaqa to steal. So sadaqin, people who steal. So that's why the double irony of the title uh, isn't it crazy that we call we are calling thieves when people we actually stole things from them, if you like? And um, Christopher Wren said in his memoirs at the end of his life that he believed that the Gothic style, the, the famous Gothic style of all the uh, European cathedrals, um, should rightly be called the Saracen style. So that's why the, the word Saracens had to be in the title. And it's very key. And, and Christopher Wren explains that he, he used Saracen vaulting in the dome of St. Paul's because, quite simply, it was the best. And he explains in some detail exactly why it's the best, and he draws diagrams. Um, so this was a conclusion he reached at the end of his life, basically. And he, he coincided when, when he was... Um, professor at Oxford, he coincided with the beginning of um, Arabic studies in Oxford. The very first chair, the Ar Arabic um, professorship was established and lots of manuscripts were coming into Oxford with new scientific material that was very, very relevant for architecture. 
And Christopher Wren, a uh, very open-minded man, he, he um, avidly read all of these new manuscripts. People were there, new scholars were there to translate mm -hmm. it. And people like him learnt a huge amount from it about, about the importance of geometry and new ways of vaulting. So that's why, at the end of his okay. life, he reached that conclusion that what we call Gothic um, should rightly be called, um, you know, instead of calling it Gothic, we should rightly call it Saracenic in, in the 17th century. I like that, Saracenic. Um, and, and you, of course, yourself studied Arabic at Oxford University, didn't you? Yes, I did. I did. Where, where, by where by, you, by you, a weird coincidence, I was actually at <laughs> the same college as Christopher Wren. <laughs> oh, really? Gosh. <laughs> I've always known quite a lot about it. <laughs> yes, first-hand experience. <laughs> yes, right. yes. So the, the earliest example of Gothic, as mm -hmm. most art historians tend to, to think of it, is this Basilica of Saint-Denis in, in the suburbs of Paris. And uh, you can see that the style is pointed arches, vaulted ceilings. Um, and the thing about the, po the, the pointed arches is that they're stronger structurally, so they enable the building to go much taller mm. um, and let in more light. And this is a big transition from the earlier Romanesque architecture, which was thick walls, small windows, very dark interiors. So this is a sort of transition where um, suddenly stained glass windows become very important because of the light. So it's a very, very major mm. transition in, um, in, in architectural terms. And the person who was responsible for, who, well, who's credited with <laughs> the invention of of Gothic, and that in itself is, of course, ridiculous, as if it just sort of popped out like some virgin birth in the middle of France. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, is, is the abbot of Saint-Denis, who is Abbot Suger, who put himself in the, um, in the stained glass window. So here he is at, uh, at the foot of Christ in, in the... Um, oh, wow. I wonder, in I wonder what he was doing lying down there, but he's obviously, he's reaching out to the hem of Christ in... in yes, exactly. That's right. A sort of, you know, sort yeah. of worshipful position, yeah. um, pretending to be sort of very humble. But in <laughs> fact, a lot of the inscriptions in, in Saint-Denis, he, he proclaims himself, you know, as, as the great inventor of this, uh, oh, right. um, of, of this sort of new style. Um, <laughs> uh, but the whole thing... And it, a glass is 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 incredibly important. Um, stained glass, incredibly important in Gothic architecture, and um, I'm going to explain a little a bit why that is now. Because um, all the the actual raw materials for the glass were mm. shipped in from Syria. The, the the Crusaders, when they went to the Holy Land, and of course in those days Syria. Um, was the Holy Land as well. The province of Syria was the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean. Wow. And they, they uh, discovered this beautiful glass with these incredible qualities um, with the colors. And, and so they had nothing like that in Europe at the time. So this glass was shipped back in huge quantities. And it was only that the, the, the raw materials were only found in Syria. Syria was the world leader in glass at this time. And... The, um, they also um, developed the, so, so the colours. So in, in some of the stained glass uh, windows in, in, in the famous Gothic cathedrals of Europe, like uh, Chartres, and even some in, in this country, in England, um, in Canterbury Cathedral, some of these glass uh, windows have been analysed scientifically and have been traced back to the Syrian source. Um, so, so this is still glass that, mm -hmm. um, where the raw materials came from Syria. And on the right-hand side there is a glass goblet made in Syria, which is on display in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, which displays enameled glass. And this technique of enameled glass was, again, invented in Syria. It was a, mm. it was a beautiful um, uh, an innovative thing. Nothing, nothing of that sort existed um, in, in Europe at the time. And what that led to in the stained glass windows was this technique where, where Europeans realized for the first time that they could, instead of this very laborious business of, of staining each different piece of glass and making up a very complicated jigsaw type picture, mm. they could just paint naturally on the glass um, yeah. using enameled paint, using it like a canvas, 
And then um, the whole thing was ready. So it's like an artist drawing on a, on a sheet of glass. Right. And then the whole thing was fired and enameled and made permanent. And you can so tell it, that then as a style, it. this later style, because you've got the bars of the glazing. Right. Ah. Um, so you can tell immediately that that's the later style. Interesting. Is that poor old Jonah there being eaten up it by is. Jonah? And and I'll also tell you, yes, can you, can you see Jonah's eye, his, his incredible blue eye, a blue-eyed whale? <laughs> but oh, this God, is yeah. actually in the chapel of Wadham College. So so Christopher Wren would have actually... In, seen in, in Oxford itself, so Christopher Wren would have seen that. Uh, yes, he, he would have seen that um, because it was, it was commissioned there. Um, and so using the Syrian technique, <laughs> he would not have known that, of course. Um, so I, I thought that's a, a rather nice um, sort of irony, really, mm. that he was un unwittingly surrounded by things from Syria <laughs> no uh, that, that he didn't uh, he didn't realise. Wow, but, that's um, an amazing photograph. Yes. So now I'll, I'll move on to why I wrote the book at all, because mm. uh, really it was all triggered by the fire at Notre Dame Cathedral back in April 2019. And when I saw the world reaction to this fire mm. and this great outcry, um, you know, oh, from the French, you know, our national identity is going up in flames. And, you know, France is a secular nation. You know, it's not Very even so, that yeah. attached to uh, things like you know, ancient cathedrals. Mm. Um, so I, 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 it struck me as a bit sort of, um, you know, <laughs> sort of, uh, well, hypocritical is not probably quite the right word, but, but incongruous, sort of incongruous. It, and yes, incongruous and sort of lacking in knowledge, really. That mm. I, I thought to myself, well, hang on a minute, you know, this isn't your national identity. Don't you realize that all the um, features of Gothic architecture that you're claiming as your national identity, um, all of the features, you know, the pointed arches, the trefoil arches, pretty much everything except the flying buttresses, has actually come from the East. Wow. Uh, and so I, I've known that most of my life because, you know, of the nature of what I've studied over the course of my life and the fact that I've been lucky enough to travel so yeah. widely across the Middle East. But So I assumed that people knew this. <laughs> but wow. when, when it was fairly clear that people didn't know it, I thought, right, I'd better... I'd better write something about it and explain. And, and so luckily, so the uh, my publishers, you know, were, were very happy with the idea. And they said, mm. yes, you know, off you go and do it. So, so. Um, and, and this is the, the, the what, what you, that, that thought gave birth to is extraordinary. That's right. Yeah. Lavishly yeah. illustrated yeah. book. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the irony, the, I mean, just, just to pause on this extre extreme irony, as you rightly say, France is a, a very secular state. I, yes. I spent a lot of time yeah. there and it really is. Uh, um, and yet, as you say, the Notre Dame, Our Lady, it refers to yes, the Virgin yes. Mary, the Mary, the Mother of yes. Jesus, in this archetypal symbol, Notre Dame in Paris, which tragically was burnt, nearly, nearly destroyed, but it's not been destroyed. It's been, Macron has promised, I think, within five years to rebuild it exactly as it was uh, mm. before it was seriously damaged in this fire. And yet, as you rightly say, so much of it, the design, uh, the construction, the the beauty of it actually owes its origins to the other Muslim or Arab Middle East. And the irony here is extraordinary, but it doesn't seem to be um, in the consciousness of many French people, you say. This is not, they're not aware of this fact. The other rather nice um, thing, I think, is that miraculously, the stained glass in Notre Dame survived the fire. Okay. Gosh. And and my my own theory about that is that this is because of the Syrian glass. It was incredibly strong. It has these little bubbles in it. It's all made from this organic material. Mm. Um, it can't be re recreated now. I mean, it's it just, you know, the, the, the raw materials are not the same. You know, they're made industrially produced and things. You're never going to get glass of that type before. It's very thick and it's got these beautiful bubbles in it which make it stronger. So this wow. incredible Syrian glass survived the fire. Uh, mm. It's been need cleaning, of course, but it's uh, the actual glass itself is intact. But, but um, who is yeah. this? It seems to have lost his head. Um, yes, yes. Okay. So, so this this guy who is Saint Denis Saint Denis um, is on the front of uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. So he he stands. He's one of the statues on the front. Mm. And he is the patron saint of France, mm. as the French claim. However, <laughs> again, here we're into another sort of slightly extraordinary irony. Mm. Um, 
he is not uh, the person that they think he is. Uh, there were an awful lot of uh, misinformation, confused identities back in the Middle Ages, because, of mm. course, you know, people's knowledge um, was, was restricted, essentially, to what the clergy um, told them. And, and most people were illiterate. You know, there was no such thing as internet or anything like that. So, so um, he became the patron saint of France. Now, later scholarship, centuries later, discovered that, uh, in fact, um, the Dennis, who, who, who was claiming to be um, a disciple of St. Paul, um, and uh, who wrote a book called Celestial Hierarchies, which was very influential in, in the formation of Gothic. Um, he, he, in fact, turned out to be a 6th century, late 5th, early 6th century Syrian monk. Uh -huh. So nothing, nothing to do with, and, and, but this only came out much, much later. Mm -hmm. So this is happening quite a lot these days. Later Later scholarship is unearthing a lot of sort of untruths, if you like, um, that were just based on ignorance. It, it actually happened a lot, these sort of confused identities. So there were, in fact, three different Dennises. One was a Roman soldier who was martyred. Um, one was this uh, um, supposed um, disciple um, of St. Paul. And then the real one, the real one who actually wrote this book, <laughs> <laughs> that was so influential in Gothic turns out to be a Syrian monk. Uh, so the Syrian so, connection is there again. Um, yes, yes. So this takes us to Syria, oh. which is why the next few pictures now I'm going to show you are in Syria, and mm. and some of these are pictures I've taken myself because um, obviously you know I know Syria extremely well. Mm. Um, and uh, sadly, this this picture here is 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 in northwest Syria, what's what's now Idlib province, where the um, the last remaining um, rebel stronghold, as it's often referred to, but an awful lot of displaced Syrians, you know, who've lost their homes, mm -hmm. have ended up pushed out in, in sort of starve and surrender sieges, the, the like of which are going on in Mariupol in Ukraine at the moment. So people were pushed out and forced further north to take refuge up in Idlib province, which is a very rugged rural province. Mm. Um, and on the hills of Idlib, there are about 2,000 um, churches and, and in, in about 800 villages, early Christian villages. So these are the earliest examples of Christian architecture from the 4th, 5th and 6th centuries. And it's an absolute treasure trove um, of, of early architectural um, styles. Mm. And one of the churches there called Kalb Lausde. This is all built from the local limestone. Yes. Has the first twin towers flanking a monumental entrance, which is what Notre Dame Cathedral, of course, you know, and all, all the Gothic cathedrals um, base themselves on. So this is obviously early Christian. This has nothing to do with Islam as such, but the point mm -hmm. is, you know, the, these, the ideas all came from further east um, and then got absorbed as well into um, into some aspects of Islamic architecture in, in a very interesting way. Mm. So, so this uh, site of Kalblaze is on the pilgrimage route to the main pilgrimage center of the day um, at St. Simeon's Basilica. This was the Santiago de Compostela of its day. It was absolutely key. And pilgrims came from all over Europe to, um, to, to uh, you know, to, to uh, to see the shrine where St. Simeon, who preached from his pillar um, there, became this very famous person. This is about 50 years before the Hagia Sophia was built really? in Constantinople. Yeah. But just to show you now the quality of the workmanship on this local um, limestone, and this is relevant for the skills of the Syrian masons, basically. The Syrian so, you know, literally, stone masonry is as old as the hills, quite literally. And look at look at the beautiful way in which they've even conveyed the movement of the acanthus leaves there, as if they're swaying in the wind. Mm. You know, this you know for, for for fifth century stone carving, this is this is astonishing. In, in and it survived uh, one and a half millennia in, in, oh, in through time. Yes. Wars and weather beaten, uh, and it's, it's still there uh, to be. Uh, uh, today. Yes, I mean there has been damage, unfortunately, in the last eleven years during the war. Um, but obviously, not everything has is you know there has been patchy damage 
Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, occasional uh, Russian airstrikes, would you believe, have hit Simians. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but of course, you know, the world wasn't terribly interested back then. <laughs> um, anyway, so St. Simeon himself, um, just to show you, as I said, it's so important in Europe um, that he starts to appear in, in European art. So he's in a stained glass window here on the left in a, in a little village in France that's even called St. Simeon. And so really? he's got his own church, his own stained glass window, and there he is standing on his pillar. So he's on his on his plinth, which he kind of spent many years up and became an, right. an aesthetic kind of hero. Yeah. Uh, people used well, to get hermit figure. Yes, yeah. he reached yeah. to the top of his his pillar, and and on the right there, this is a mosaic of Saint Simeon on preaching from his pillar, and that is inside Saint Mark's Basilica in in Venice. Wow! Oh, really? Gosh. So so he 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 crops up a lot in uh, across across Europe. So um, you know this is a ver- very big influence, and pilgrims come back with all their knowledge and ideas um, that they've seen of the architecture, the styles, and they bring them back to to Europe. Mm. So so that's the the sort of Christian background, if you like, the Christian inheritance. But then when the first Islamic dynasty, the Umayyads come and, and, and make their um, capital in Damascus. Uh, this is, you know, I've just given you an idea of what they have to build on by way of the architecture that's already there, that of course gives them ideas as well. And so you, you have then a kind of blending of early Christian and early, early Muslim architecture. And the first building that the Umayyads uh, create as their sort of statement that we are a new uh, a new religion, because up until that point, actually, in, in, in Jerusalem, the local Christians had assumed that the Muslim rulers were, were just another heretical Christian sect. They hadn't appreciated this was an entirely new yeah. religion. Yeah. So the Dome of the Rock, built by the Caliph uh, Abdul Malik um, in 690, uh, is the first building, and you can see again how blended the architecture is, because Mm. there are elements of early Christian Byzantine, Mm. uh, the octagonal shape, Mm. the the, the dome there, Um, but it's very different um, in in key ways that I'm going to explain. For a start, the the decoration is all on the outside, whereas in Byzantine architecture, all the mosaic work is on the inside. The outside is very plain. But here, this is a statement. This is um, a statement, and the inscription that runs around the outside there at the mm. top mm. Um, is is a statement to the Christians of Jerusalem that um, we are a new religion and admonishing Christians for believing in the Trinity and instead of the one God. So it's a very, very significant building. Um, and inside it, for the first time, are two innovations that have never appeared in Christian architecture up to this point. Uh, at the bottom, there are the beginnings of the pointed arch, mm-hmm. alternating with a round arch. So you see at the bottom there under the dome, you've got two round arches in the middle and then flanking yeah. them on either side, you've got the beginnings of the pointed arch. Mm-hmm. And then up under the dome itself, you can see a little, a little row of trefoil arches. Now that's sort of little triple arches and they become so important then in in, in Christian and Gothic architecture because uh, when Christians take that on, they use it to represent the Trinity. The, uh, so, so that's what it represents all over Gothic cathedrals. That's why you see it so much. Mm. But, um, but the actual first time that appears is here in, in the Dome of the Rock on a Muslim shrine. And this was just a few years after the death of the prophet Muhammad, actually. This is in the 7th century. Um, yes, yes. So it, it's very, very early. Mm. It is early, yes. But it, it took it took the Umayyads. I mean, they didn't arrive and then immediately build this building. You know, they have to consolidate their um, their rule. And so I think it was um, it was about 50 years after the conquest of Damascus that they, they actually built it. Mm. Um, so, I mean, as 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 always, you know, you, I mean, a, a new a new um, ruler doesn't just immediately build something. You know, it takes a takes a while. These things are, uh, are surprisingly slow, and architectural styles evolve very very slowly. One of the things mm. I, I I discovered in 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 the book that was very interesting, mm. and and now this is uh, this early this map 
This is a map of Jerusalem with the Dome of the Rock, center stage, so a Muslim shrine. But yep. this, is, um, this is a map drawn by a 15th century uh, pilgrim. And it, it's the very first pictorial map that was ever done of Jerusalem. So it was very popular. It got printed in, in, in many, um, many countries across Europe and was very influential for centuries. Mm. And what it shows is that Christians thought of the Dome of the Rock as the center of Jerusalem. And that, again, was based on ignorance <laughs> because uh, crusaders, when they first took Jerusalem in the First Crusade, assumed, uh, they, and they labelled it on all their maps, they assumed that, that the Dome of the Rock was the Temple of Solomon. Mm. And so they adopted it, the Templars, you may have heard of the Templar Knights, um, and that's from the Temple of Solomon. And they put it, they put the Dome of the Rock on their coins, and it becomes a very, very important um, symbol, symbol of Templar Christianity and of Jerusalem. This is a great irony, of course, that they should think that. But I'm a bit confused. You have Josephus, who wrote in the first century about the destruction of the temple in the Jewish wars. Um, so it, it was kind of, I would have thought it would have been known that, that the, the temple, the Solomon's temple, the second temple, did not survive. It was destroyed by the Romans. That's the very point. It's prophesied in the Gospels, in you mm. know Matthew 24 and Mark 13, that the, the temple will be destroyed. And yet they thought that this was as you, put it, as you put it, Solomon's temple. Uh, so I, um, I find that surprising they would have thought that, given even their own Bibles suggest that the temple would be destroyed. It, it is remarkable, isn't it? It is remarkable. But, but uh, again, the, the historical evidence uh, shows that, that, that the Templars um, actually interacted remarkably little with the local population. And, and they didn't, for example, the, the Arabic inscription around the Dome of the Rock, um, hmm. They they didn't uh, they thought that was the language uh, of Christ and therefore uh -huh. holy holy language which uh -huh. is why okay. Arabic script starts to appear um, in churches and cathedrals in um, <laughs> in 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 France uh, because they think it's holy so again it's extraordinary sort of levels of, of of um, ignorance and, and sort of misunderstanding, <laughs> really, which, which well, I mean, the Middle Ages is full of that. <laughs> well, true. They, they were completely ignorant. I mean, a, a Arabic and Aramaic, the language of Jesus, are cognate Semitic languages. So, you know, um, if they're going to get it wrong, they've got it wrong in a way that's fairly close to being right. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yes. Anyway, so, so, um, so this is just to show you now some more innovations that the Omeyads brought in. So... Oh. Um, the Umayyads, uh, an early stone, uh, an early sort of rosette uh, uh, window, you know, decorative window with coloured glass. So the Umayyads um, had these palaces. That, so these are secular buildings. And uh, the one here is Khirbat al which is in the, um, the occupied West Bank near, near Jericho. Mm. And this was excavated for many, many years by a team back in the um, late 30s and early 40s. So a long time ago, um, but very, very thoroughly catalogued and, and referenced. And um, based on those, on those archaeological digs, they, they were able to reconstruct this window, which was high up in the audience Hall of the caliph, and beneath it were fragments of coloured glass. So it was clearly a decorative window in an important place. And so again, that that is a um, an idea that then, of course, took seven centuries to reach its absolute peak in the rose window in Chartres Cathedral there, which yeah, is I, illustrated I, 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 on, on the right. And Notre Dame as well, I guess, because there's a yes, yes, all or, uh, of course, or the 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 um, the western facade. Mm. of most gothic cathedrals has its its rose window yeah um, so yes it is uh it is, it, is remarkable. it is remarkable and this is another omeyad palace um and you can see again the twin towers flanking the monumental entrance so this was the main entrance to the uh, omeyad palace of um castle hair or harbi it's called mm. and it was reconstructed here in the center of damascus and this is the main entrance to the damascus national museum so it's still there 
As you can see, it's fairly, fairly fragmentary, mm -hmm. um, but the style is there, which, and of course this style is taken then from the, uh, from the churches, which the Emirates will have seen all over Syria, mm. um, except that they've made the towers rounded rather than rectangular. And when you have a close-up of some of these Umayyad palaces, mm -hmm. you can again see the sheer quality of the stonemasonry. Uh, this one is, is from uh, Kasar Mushatta, as it's known, which is actually on display in Berlin. So if you're in Berlin or anywhere near it, you can go to the, the Museum of Islamic Art and see this up really close to see again this incredible uh, stonemasonry, because of course the stonemasonry skills were there already. And so the Umayyads used the, um, the, the local stonemasonry skills um, and, uh, you know, benefited a lot, no doubt, from, from, the, um, from the styles. And again, it's this, this thing about nature sort of bursting out the energy of, of, mm -hmm. of this, these styles. And that's something I associate with the Umayyads, this sort of incredible energy of plant life bursting out in these sort of mm. you know, nature, nature so so uh you know uh as, as if it's sort of real s eternal springtime really so a sort of you know visions visions of, of paradise yes yeah, so, so I, was, I was thinking of that yes yeah. um and and now this this is in the center of damascus the Umayyad, um uh the Umayyad mosque right in the center and of course this was built um on the site of the cathedral of saint john and uh, the, the cathedral was, uh, was taken down. Well, actually, for, it's worth mentioning that for 100 years, um, it was shared, actually. The, the, the site was shared between Muslims and Christians. They used the same entrance and they just, uh, Christians turned one way and the Muslims turned the other way. And they just used separate parts of the building to worship. Um, and and that, that arrangement only came to an end after nearly a century because they literally ran out of space. Um, and this was quite common, by the way, in Syria. I mean, it, it happened in, in most of the main city mosques. The, 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 the existing church in the center was used by both Muslims and Christians. But anyway, they ran out of space in, in Damascus. And so they then um, negotiated with the Christians to say, right, we now want to take over the site to build our main mosque. And in return, we'll give you the land for four new uh, churches and and to this day those churches those other churches exist there are 17 churches across the old city of damascus and on a sunday morning their their church bells uh, ring out and mingle with the call to prayer in in a way that um has been normal for millennia in, in syria it's always been this sort of very blended blended society it, 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 it's worth pausing i mean particularly with the terrible events that happened in in syria with isis and so on the extraordinary um viciousness and intolerance shown by this these these, these people but uh, as you say for over millennia christians and uh muslims coexisted it would seem peacefully worshipped even in the same buildings although they're not mm. same services obviously but uh mm. benefiting from the same structure anyway and this was normal for uh, over a thousand years and it's it's important to remember that mm. as the, the, the norm rather than the aberration we've seen just very recently exactly. um yeah exactly yes isis represents a complete aberration you know i mean it, it's uh and it's completely distorted people's image of, of Islam, unfortunately. Um, but, but yes, so, so, so here we mentioned about visions of paradise. So again, this is another very good example of sort of blending of the architecture. So this is the inside of the Umayyad Mosque. And this literally is a vision of paradise. So you'd have had um, the, the Christian mosaicists working on this um, building. So again, you know, Christ Christian craftsmen, because they were the mosaic experts, um, but under the direction of new Umayyad rulers, um, building a vision of paradise. So this is trees, gardens, rivers, fantasized buildings. But um, if you look at the, the, the way they've absorbed the earlier Christian styles as well. So you've got the Trinity, the three arches there, the three windows, right. um, which is exactly what they would have seen in the churches all over Syria. And they've taken the classical columns and capitals there, the pink um, uh, columns be between the windows, which uh, are taken from the Roman and Hellenistic sites like Palmyra that, again, were covering Syria. So they saw other styles and absorbed them 
but synthesize them then into something new. Mm. And, and this, is, this is the pattern that happens again and again. A, a new culture comes in, sees what's already on the ground, takes aspects of it and absorbs it, and then synthesizes it with some new ideas into yeah. some, something else. And that, that's, that's the beauty of it, really. That's why all cultures are independent, uh, you know, interdependent and, and, and sort of you know, mingle in, in ways that um, I think it's important to understand. That little thing in the red circle, by the way, is just where during the war um, a mortar shell did land on those mosaics and caused some damage, but, but it was repaired very quickly. And, and um, now you, you would be hard pushed to even find where, where the damage was. Oh. Um, and then the final um, image of the Amayads is in a, in a town in the Bakar Valley in what is now Lebanon, um, a town called Anjar. And it, it shows this sort of double-decker style, as I call it. You know, you've got, um, you've got two rows of arches that, that start to be used. Um, and uh, you see then that what happens next so is, is that in, this is carried over into Spain. Yeah. So just, just to explain a bit of the historical background here. So the Umayyads come to an end abruptly in 750 with the Abbasids who come in and, and who kill all the um, members of the Umayyad family, except for one Umayyad prince, Abdurrahman, who manages to escape uh, and travel across uh, North Africa and eventually set up his own caliphate in Spain. Okay. So what he does, of course, like all exiles, is he tries to create his homeland in his new country. So he tries to create Syria and the Umayyad styles in Spain. And so here, um, his dynastic colors were red and white, which is why you have the red and white arches. And you have, uh, this is the interior of um, the Cordoba Mosque, or Mesquita, as it's known locally, um, which was his capital, Abdurrahman capital, so the new Umayyad capital in Spain with this um, double-decker arches. Mm. And uh, this is its aerial view, and it's modelled on the Damascus Umayyad Mosque. Uh, it has the same courtyard style. It's, it's been added to over the centuries by his successors, which is why it's grown in size. And then, of course, later under the Reconquista, um, Ferdinand and Isabella build a cathedral in the middle of it, which you can see there in the, in the aerial photo. Um, but I'll show you now the interior, which is so important in the Cordoba Mesquita. Mm. This is the mehrab. And look at those trefoil arches running across the top. There are seven of them. So this is the holiest place in the mosque, uh, de the, the decoration around the mehrab itself. And um, they're using trefoil arches um, as holy symbols. And uh, so, of course, this is the first time the trefoil arch comes onto the European mainland, and many Europeans now see it. Um, and it moves, and obviously, no, more it, into, it, into it no longer symbolizes the Trinity, of course, now. The, 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 the threefold uh, pattern there is decorative rather than theological. Right? It's decorative. It probably re represents, you know, um, a sort of uh, three leaves or something like that. It's almost certainly some sort of representation of nature. I mean, so much of Islamic art is based on on nature. Mm. Um, but yes, so so it it it. But and yet it it clearly is is regarded as holy in in some way but this is this is completely new this did not exist in christian architecture before and mm. and indeed at this point when the cordoba mesquita was built it did not exist in in christian architecture it this it comes later you know they, they, the idea is taken from buildings like this in uh, in in cordoba in in spain and the the um the Umayyads in spain develop the, the triple arch, the trefoil arch, into more arches. So that they, I mean, you know, arches, right. yeah. arches were absolutely um, the favourite thing. You know, the, the proverb, the arch never sleeps. You know, the, the yeah. arch is, is a wonderful symbol. Um, and so here we have, um, you know, this one has got, what, uh, five, five. So this is called a sankfoil arch. Um, right. 
And now, because of course it's a it's a cathedral, you have a rather incongruous thing of crucifixes yes, put, yes. put in between. And when you when you visit um, the Cordoba Mesquita these days, it is it is rather disconcerting because they're, it's so clearly a mosque, and yet you know church music is playing in the background, and right. there are all these chapels that have been stuck on around the edges with with crucifixes all around there. Yet you can't get away from the fact that this is clearly clearly a mosque. Um, and, and this is actually the Cordova synagogue, which you can see uses exactly the same style. So the Jews in Cordova, who were very much part of society and were respected by the Umayyads, the Christians and the Jews, you know, were, were held high positions in, in the um, administration. Yeah. And they, from choice, adopted all the Islamic styles. So, so it's, it's quite hard to see the differences, actually. And, and after they were expelled from um, Oh yes. Spain, they chose to use the um, uh, the um, Islamic styles in in their in their new synagogues in places like Berlin. Indeed. I was going to say the, the it seems to be seven um, uh, not petals, but uh, uh, loops there, which, which the number seven perhaps symbolising perfection in some Jewish tradition. Well, yes, yes, exactly. I mean, each culture would have would have adopted, you know. Um, what 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 suited their own beliefs more, but but the 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 shapes and the ideas you know move between cultures. This is right. this is the interesting thing, and here um, so this whole idea of interlocking arches also began in in Cordova. It's it's something that again has come over from the Umayyads, and on so on the right there that is the exterior of the Cordova Mosque, and on the on the left is that's the interior of Durham Cathedral. In, in England, Gosh. and you can see, it, and again, the dates fit perfectly. That um, you know, this is one of the earliest um, uh, after after people came back. Um, you know, Europeans came back uh, to England, having seen styles like this. Um, they start to appear then in 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 English cathedrals and in and in French cathedrals. If one didn't know, well, the, the the picture on my left of Durham Cathedral, well, you wouldn't know that was in England. You, that that could yeah. be in the Middle East. Yeah. yeah, it's actually called the Galilee Chapel in in inside oh. um, in inside Durham Cathedral as well. And now this is a very important image. This is the the vaulting directly above. The mihrab. In fact, you can place it from the same the tree. If you look along the bottom of the image, the same three, uh, sorry, seven, um, the row of seven trefoil arches there at the top of the mihrab. So this is the the vaulting, the dome vaulting immediately above the mihrab in the Cordoba Mesquita, and and this is uh, the very first example on European soil now of the Islamic vaulting system that Christopher Wren talks about, you know, yes. this, this supreme understanding of geometry, uh, which is so important. And it was examined um, just a few years ago by a couple of Spanish architectural engineers. Um, they did a, an exhaustive report on it and they were completely flabbergasted. They, they, at the astonishing level of the geometry, and they said it's an absolute masterpiece and it's never needed structural repair in its entire thousand year existence. So again, you know, the, 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 the vaulting techniques that came into Europe from, um, you know, Syria and, and um, the Eastern Mediterranean there were, were astonishing and were so influential then mm. in, 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 in Gothic architecture. And at the back of the Cordoba Mesquita is, is a whole wall of all the Mason's marks. Mm. So the, these were uncovered in one of the excavations. And when you look at the names, they're overwhelmingly Arab names in Arabic script. No. So again, all the masons responsible for this astonishing um, vaulting techniques were Muslim. Mm -hmm. So uh, and and Muslim masons were heavily valued in in Spain, I mean, even after the Reconquista with with, um, uh, with Ferdinand and Isabella drove out so so many Muslims. They a few a few Muslim um, architects and masons were kept on by the, by the kings and queens because they wanted them to build mm. new palaces for them in, in these styles, which they, which they liked so much. Mm -hmm. And this is what had been the minaret in the Cordoba Mesquita going up in registers and becoming more and more elaborate the higher it gets. Um, and now, of course, has been turned into the bell tower mm. of, um, of the cathedral. 
so so that's that's the story of Spain. So that's the main gateway, as I call it, into um, in, into Europe. One of the other important gateways, um, and this is the, how the pointed arch itself found its way into Europe, is is via Amalfi on the Italian coast, and that's because the Amalfi merchants were trading with cities in the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly Cairo, and they saw the pointed arches of the Ibn Tulun Mosque in Cairo and liked it and brought it um, and said, we would like that in our new cathedral that we're building. So they imported the laborers because, of course, local people in Amalfi didn't have a clue how to build a a pointed arch. So um, this became... uh, So so then then they saw uh, the pointed arch and used it in the cathedral, and then visiting abbots from the Benedictines uh, came and uh, saw it as well and copied it, basically, and used it in their their monasteries, first in Monte Cassino and then at Cluny, which is the the head of the Benedictine order. Mm. And once, once the Benedictines adopted the pointed arch, of course, it was it was all the rage, basically, mm-hmm. and it, and it then starts to spread um, into Europe, and and all all these sort of um, features that have been taken in start to appear in um, uh, pilgrimage routes, you know, like like the route to the Santiago de Compostela route. Um, so this is one of the one of the stopping points on that, where you can see the sort of the two tone arches. There are examples of Kufic script there, which, as I mentioned, you know, they thought of as holy uh, language of Christ, get it, get absorbed. Amazing. Um, and and this kind of thing starts to appear. Um, uh, God as the geometer of of the earth, you know, showing God as the creator of the earth using a compass. Um, and this starts to appear in 12th century um, manu- Christian manuscripts. So around about the time that, that Gothic cathedrals are, are reaching their peak, basically, they start to realize the importance of geometry in being able to create these tall Gothic cathedrals with their incredible vaulting. Um, and this is now in Venice, um, St. Some, some Mark's Basilica. Now, Christopher Wren himself describes this as a Saracenic building. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> well, now, now I can understand well, what he was getting at. It's much clearer why he would have said that as, as an architect. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's got five domes, St. Mm. Mark's, and all of them use this double dome technique, as it's called. Um, um, and so, you know, he, he understood all of that. Um, Venice, Venice itself is incredibly um, influenced by Islamic yeah. architecture. I, I, I've been there, uh, just going around. It's very noticeable the the, the yes. uh, Islamic influence actually all over Venice. Yeah, and they loved it. I mean, the Venetians loved it. Yeah, they yeah. reveled in it and, and and were very proud of it and, and and reused you know the pointed arches, the trefoil arches. So this is the Doge's Palace, which is actually yeah. modelled on a on a uh, a palace in Cairo in in terms of its um, you know style and its dimensions. Um, again, on the left is the Doge's Palace. In, it's like a sort of cathedral of commerce, you know, in that this was the heart of the Venetian Empire. Um, and on the right there is, is a, a carpet factory, would you believe, in Glasgow, <laughs> which <laughs> modelled itself on the, on the Doge's Palace. So you see all these Islamic features taken into commercial buildings, mm. um, you know, in a very interesting way the, uh, how these things move across and this is again venice the palaces you see that round what we call the telephone dial motif on that mm-hmm. palace that's again taken directly off a, a mamluk palace in in cairo and the the venetians loved loved these styles yes very common very common and, uh, and now just quickly to show you some images of Ravenna, early Christian architecture in Ravenna. Again, people think of this as, oh, Ravenna is so Christian. Um, this is the sort of epitome of early Christianity. But <laughs> what, what people don't seem to understand is that Ravenna, the patron saint of Ravenna, Apollinaris, was from Antioch. He's, again, another Assyrian monk. And all the bishops of Ravenna um, up until the year 425 were from Syria. Um, and this is all recorded in the church's own records. And when I look at that mosaic there in the dome of the church of, in, in Vienna, in, in, in Ravenna, 
it's it's so Syrian to me. I mean, all, all the iconography of that, I recognize it immediately. The colors, it, it stands out to me as exactly like mosaics I have seen in, in early Syrian churches. Wow. Uh, and then, uh, again, this is also Ravenna, the same style, the Lamb of God. All of, all of these styles have come directly from Syria. I recognize them, you know, that the, sim- the symbolism of it all. Mm. And yet it's, it's that backstory isn't, isn't acknowledged in Ravenna itself. There's absolutely no mention of the Syrian connections. Um, it, it's as if, you know, it just again, as if it just sort of popped out <laughs> by some miracle in Ravenna without <laughs> any understanding of the backstory of it. It's been airbrushed out of history. Their, their yes. cultural debt to uh, the yes. Arab world it has been airbrushed out. Well, that's right, yes. And then, and then this is the final gateway, um, Sicily oh. itself, which, of course, um, you know, was spent a time under, under the yeah. Normans. And uh, Roger II adopted Arab culture. He, he, he loved the, the styles very much. And so when he built his Palatine Chapel in Palermo, um, you can see the combinations there. So you've got all the Christian mosaics, but he's using the pointed arches. Mm. And on the ceiling, he imports Fatimid um, wood uh, carpenters to make the beautiful Mukarnas uh, ceiling um, because, again, they're the only people who are going to know how to build it. So no, no local person in Palermo would, would have the skills to build a thing like that. So, so again, these styles start to be imported in, into Europe. So um, just quickly now, the, the final slides I'll, I'll run through. Um, this is, is actually inside Notre Dame. And I'm showing you this because of the heraldry aspect. Now, you see behind the king, this is the king of England being crowned in Notre Dame. And um, this is a particularly strange period of, of, <laughs> of history when uh, French and English history were, were very complex. <clears throat> but behind it, you've got the symbols, the fleur-de-lis, which is yeah. always associated with French royalty, and the lion, which is always associated with English royalty. Yeah. But these symbols, in fact, were brought back from Syria by the Crusader knights because they saw Syrian, um, Syrians uh, having jousting competitions on horseback, and they would wear on their helmets symbols um, like lions, um, but with no, with no particular sort of hierarchical um, idea behind it. It's just because they liked those symbols and they associated them with their own families. But then the idea caught on and was carried back to, um, by the Crusaders back into Europe, and it developed into this highly complex idea of heraldry where every family had its own shield and blazon and all the rest of it. So, but the idea itself was first seen on the, on the plains of Syria. And military architecture, again, you know, mustn't forget the military as well as the, um, the church. So styles like this, so this is the Crafty Chevalier in, in, in Syria with its round, um, round towers. And again, this is definitely something that came from the Muslim world because up until that point, um, towers had always, defensive towers had been rectangular, but then there was an understanding that it was actually stronger to have round towers that enemy yeah. cannonballs and things de- were deflected more successfully. And then the absolute peak of this was um, Chateau Gaillard. Uh, the ruin of it is still there on the Seine River between Rouen and Paris. And it uh, was built by Richard the Lionheart as his, right at the end of his life uh, as his favourite castle. Huh. My fairy castle, he, he, referred it, he referred to it as. And he incorporated all the military um, uh, architectural features that he had learnt from his time in, in the Holy Land. Mm. And now, just, just to touch on the revival at the end, so the Gothic revival now, we have, of course, it, it pops up again in the 19th century in, in, in England, all over the place. So the Houses of Parliament, Big Ben, it's all covered in pointed arches, trefoil arches, all these styles that uh, Gothic um, has taken. And then, of course, oh. um, Granada, yeah. In in uh, in Spain, the styles there in the 19th century, uh, Europeans start to have what's called their grand tour, where they start to travel across Europe and sometimes into the Eastern Mediterranean, and then you get um, you know people like um, Owen Jones who spent six months studying 
the designs and patterns in the Alhambra and was so influenced by that that he, he, he wrote his famous book, The Grammar of Ornament, which is still a key book for designers today. And this, again, you can see the patterns in the Alhambra, these styles of, of nature interwoven with all the shapes and uh, the, the sort of feeling of, of nature bursting out. Mm. When the, the arts and crafts movement begins then with William Morris, you can just see that he's absorbed all of those ideas. And he studied, although he, William Morris himself didn't travel, he studied all the, um, the tiles and the fabrics that were in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Some, some people said he almost lived in the museum, studying all these things rather than ever going home. <laughs> and the result was, was all these incredible patterns that are still all around us today. You know, mm-hmm. William Morris curtains, William Morris placemats. Oh, yes. Hugely popular. Yeah. My, my mother loves him. <laughs> She's always yes, yes, popular. yes. But you can see it's so Islamic. I mean, the yeah. way the way it's um, it's unmistakable. You know, once your eye is trained to it. Ah, oh, so cool. And and then Montmartre in in Paris, the Basilica there, um, which is actually built where um, the decapitated Saint Denis, who we saw at the beginning, Saint Denis, is is buried. And on its own website, it it talks about it the. Islamic influences in its domes. It uses yes. the same vaulting technique. Very clear. Well. Very clear. Yeah. Very clear. Yes. And then in Spain, um, on the left there is Burgos Cathedral, which Christopher Wren again talks about as a Saracenic building. Mm. <laughs> and on the right, we have the Sagrada Familia, which is still being built. Oh, in it's, Spain. it's always being still being built. <laughs> yeah. it's still being built. It's, it's finished in 2026. Oh, really? Which is, centenary of, of Gaudi's, uh, the architect's uh, yeah. death. Um, but again, you look at that and you just see how Islamic it is. And Gaudi himself was openly, um, you know, uh, um, talked about it, the influence of Islamic art. And it is like a kind of fusion of nature, mm. geometry and religion, that building. I mean, it just manages to, to bring all those fields together in this astonishing way. Mm. Um, and this is uh, a close-up of that Sagrada Familia. And again, you can see that same thing as I talked about with the Emeas right at the beginning, yes. this sort of bursting out of nature, except they've got people rather than animals here because it's a Christian building. But it's the same theory of, of nature bursting forth, you know, God God creating this wonderful gift of nature. And, the point and then are, it yeah. moves, moves across the, the Atlantic. So this yeah. is a, the American Gothic revival. This is the New York Cathedral. You've got all the Gothic things there, the Twin Towers flanking the monumental entrance. You've got the pointed arches, the trefoil arches. You've got all the elements, the rose window. Mm. It's, it's all there. And then in, in American universities, again, Gothic became all the rage. So Yale University is almost entirely Gothic campus with Harkness Tower on the, le- on the left there. And on the right is um, the main Yale Lending Library, which looks like the interior of a, of a Gothic nave. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then the final thing, the, the, capit- the U.S. Capitol building, so the heart of democracy in America, is an Islamic dome, mm. um, exactly as Christopher Wren um, showed us in, in St. Paul's Cathedral. It's exactly the same technology that he, he learned and established back in, the, back in the 17th century, learning it from the... Um, the early Islamic geometry styles that had come that had come across in, into Europe. Yes, and so, Ralph so, Williams uh, loves your book. Yes, indeed he does. Yes, yes, that's right. And I'm so proud of this endorsement by yes. Ralph Williams. I mean, really, because the, the head of the of the of the of the of the Anglican Church mm. in, you know, could could write could so completely understand what this book is all about. You know, that it's all about cultural interaction. Um, yes. and, and, and how important it is to understand that. that, that can, I just, can, I just, can I just read that out? Because I, I think it, it does summarise it. As exhilarating as it is learned, this splendidly illustrated book shows how our cultures, including our religious cultures, interact and interweave in ways that challenge all kinds of assumptions we might make out about our history by studying our past dark poses essential questions about the possibility of a shared and humane civilization in the future. That's Rome Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury. And I think that 
beautifully sums up um, the, the lesson, if, if I can put it that way, that comes strongly from uh, your, your book. And, and there's a kind of a, a, a negative um, a, a way of putting it as well, just to read a, a, a quote from the description of your book, which says, against a backdrop of Islamophobia, Europeans are increasingly airbrushing from their history, their cultural debt to the Muslim world. But this legacy lives on in some of Europe's most recognizable buildings, from Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris to the Houses of Parliament. Um, so there's two ways of looking at it in a very positive way uh, and also the, the darker uh, realities uh, of airbrushing from our history, the cultural debt to the Islamic world. So extraordinary. Mm. Yes. And, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, it is... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, the, the lesson really, to my mind, is that no one owns uh, science, you know, no one owns, um, you know, you can't say, oh, this is, this is our national style. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, hmm. it, I, I, I see it again and again, actually. I mean, um, it struck me in the Balkans recently um, with, with, you know, the Ottoman hmm. legacy in the Balkans, when, when places like Bulgaria... Um, had their revolution and and you know broke free as they saw it from from um, the Ottomans. They um, they then created what they called the Bulgarian Renaissance style of architecture. But you look at it and it's Ottoman. <laughs> it's Ottoman. <laughs> it's Ottoman. They just painted it a different colour. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and yet and yet they're trying to say this is us now. This is our identity. You know, I mean, it's 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 just absurd, frankly. You know, to <laughs> you can't pretend or, that all these boundaries existed. You know, all through the ages, people moved and travelled across. So all these artificial borders that exist today. I mean. It's it's a crazy a crazy world, you know. When I, I did a yeah. big road trip in, in October, drove mm. from England down to Albania through the Balkans. I had to pass twenty national borders, wow. and you know each set of officials at the border. You know, I mean, it's just crazy. And back in Ottoman times, of course, there were no borders. It was like <laughs> a huge common market, and everybody traded with everybody else. And the mosque was next door to the synagogue, next door to the church, and in in a lot of the Balkan towns. Um, it's still like that, you know, in, in Sarajevo, the synagogue is still there next to the mosque, next to the church. You know, it was just normal. <laughs> yeah. it, I like what you said there. You said that uh, about the, what we, no one can say they own science, that like they own. And I just remember, I, I won't mention his name, but I had a, a, a prominent a, a American um, philosopher of science on uh, several weeks ago, and he just written a book about um, intelligent design. But in the first chapter, he, he, he gives, and he's a Christian, he gives a, uh, a history of science and he in his view uh uh science owes an exclusive debt to the what he calls the judeo-christian origins of science so for him science comes out of judeo-christian tradition completely ignoring or airbrushing out any uh islamic um contributions to science which are abundantly attested in the in the historical literature um so this is uh, uh, he's making uh, science a western construct exclusively but as you say there is this intermingling this interconnectedness interweaving as as Rowan williams puts it beautifully uh that uh, is so important to acknowledge um uh, because um it has real world political implications in terms of islamophobia for example uh, which is increasing in the world today, I think. Yes, yes, I, I, I do think it's important that, that, that each culture fully understands the debt that it owes to, to all the other cultures, because everything builds on everything else. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's the key thing to, to understand. And I think if that in some way can get incorporated into um, you know, the education system, because I think a lot of the, a lot of the fault lies with the education mm. system of the different yes. countries. And um, yes. you know, I myself am a product of an education system that taught me um, as, a, as, a, as a white English person, even though my mother was German, um, but that, that's sort of irrelevant, it's still Europe. I was taught that, um, you know, everything originated in Greece and Rome, and that was the end yeah. of the matter, you know. <laughs> And that's 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 what I grew up believing until I switched to Arabic and started to travel in the Arab world and realized, well, wait a minute. <laughs>
But it's okay. Can I just no, ask no, a question I understand it. about that? You don't, I mean, if you don't mind me asking about this switch, because as you say, you, you had a a, 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 a white uh, English slash Germanic uh, background, mm. yet you ended up at Oxford studying Arabic. What, what, how did you end up there studying Arabic? What, what, what was the interest that led you there? Well, I started off at Oxford studying German and philosophy. Um, but when I got there and I started out on that course, I thought, wait a minute, I don't like German that much. You know, this seems like a complete waste of three years to do something that I already know quite well. <laughs> Why don't I do something completely different? And, and the reason I switched to Arabic was I've always been drawn to the birthplace of civilization. And I knew that the, um, you know, the Tigris and Euphrates Valley and the Nile Valley, that was where it all began. That's where society yeah. You know, early society developed, the, the early um, uh, civilizations, if you like, began. And so I've always had a fascination with that. My, my, my interests have always been, um, you know, to do with society and culture. And so uh, yeah. that's why I, I switched to, to Arabic, because I, I knew, although I'd never been to the Middle East, I'd never been east of Greece when yeah. I made that decision. But um, I never look back. I mean, I, I no. best decision I ever made as far as I know. <laughs> I, I, I really That's enjoyed good. it so much. And I've always felt at home in the Arab world, especially Syria. And you've Syria lived, has you've always been many... so multicultural, multi-ethnic right. and multi-religious in a way that I love. Yeah, gosh, and you've lived there for many, uh, many years uh, as well. Oh, well, uh, um, you, there, yes, yes. Right. Well, you obviously the, the the world has been profoundly blessed by your your decision at Oxford to switch from oh, German and philosophy. Yeah. Oh, German philosophy that would have been interesting. Studying Hegel for three years, but anyway, <laughs> uh, um, to to something perhaps a bit more beneficial. And uh, and uh, I, I'm certainly immensely pleased that you made that decision. So, uh, and I, I I do recommend this beautifully, uh, not surprisingly, beautifully illustrated book in in color lots of lots of photographs um and there's some uh, amazing reviews on the back from people like sir michael palin uh, of all people hugh kennedy actually professor of arabic at soas university of london a very distinguished and, and celebrated scholar of early islamic uh, history um he he says a great read for anyone seeking an alternative viewpoint alternative perhaps to the perhaps more traditional western narrative that you mentioned about the origins of so much coming from greece and, and Rome. So, um, uh, yeah, fantastic. So, um, thank you uh, so much indeed, um, Diana Dark, for your time, your expertise, and your wealth of knowledge, which has uh, clearly uh, made a huge impact on uh, many thinking people. And um, I'm just immensely privileged to to uh, uh, have you on, so to speak. And thank you very much indeed for your for your time. Well, thank you, Paul, for inviting me. I've I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Until next time.